destination space. Let's take a look at an example. Let's see if it actually works. So over here on this machine, I've got Metasploit installed, and I've taken, uh, actually, let me just go to where it is. I forget where I put it, actually. I believe it might be in my home directory. In your home directory, when you uh, install Metasploit, on a Unix machine at least, it's going to create an MSF3 directory. And within there, uh, let's see, under modules, nope, that's not where I put it. I must have put it in the actual Metasploit directory. So let me go back there. Anyway, in that home directory is where you're supposed to put your plugins. I have the bad habit of actually just putting them right into the Metasploit directories. So if we take a look in here in the plugins, you can see that we've got all the different kinds of plugins that are available for Metasploit. And then under modules, we've got where all of the exploits actually live, and also the payloads. So if we go into modules, exploits, Linux, notice that we've got a directory called private. In that directory, I've put this sample exploit. So here it is, I've just put it in this directory. With that in that directory, I can now run MSF console. It gives me the normal warning on an OSX machine about your Ruby interpreter. And then finally, it comes back and shows me that it's up and running. I can now use I can now use my exploit. Simply putting it in that directory, whether it's in your home directory, in your private directory, or putting it out here into the exploit directory under Metasploit, it's now installed. Simply restarting Metasploit, or if you're doing uh, some maintenance on it, maybe if you're editing it, tinkering with it, you can use our exploit to reload it as you're going. In fact, if you're doing exploit development, I really do suggest that you monitor the Metasploit log that you'll find in your private directory as you're doing the development and reloading the exploit. Metasploit will silently fail to load exploit modules that are not properly formatted or that have some problem. The information is found in that log file. So what I'll usually do is follow that log file while I'm editing the exploit so that every time I reload it in Metasploit, I can see what's happening and tinker with it. I didn't do that in this case because you'll actually also find that there are a number of other things that are reporting failures into the log that just haven't been cleaned up in Metasploit just yet. So I didn't do that for our particular example here. The next thing I need to do is to choose a payload. So let's set our payload, and let's see, what would we like to use here? Let's use a Linux x86 bind, uh, let's see, bind TCP, oh, shell, bind TCP, that sounds good. Show options, so use the Windows version. So I still need to define what my remote host is. And well, let's see, you need that also for the for the payload. So that's it. Notice that it filled in the remote port for me automatically. So all I need now is the IP address of that remote machine. The remote machine here is running at 192.168.145.131. So let's set that in here. 192.168.14. And let's write to exploit. Setting 124 byte payload. Exploit completed, no session created. Let's try to restart our server. It says it got a connection. Let's try it one more time. No session created. Oh, now I have a command shell. Sometimes you may find that you need to run it more than once. In this particular case, the first run failed, the second run succeeds. Of course, to make this more reliable, we would want to then experiment and see exactly what's happening over there on the server. I still have core files enabled, so I can determine what the cause is and track down any, any actual problems to make this much more reliable. But the point is that once we've done that initial research and gathered those values, Porting that over into a Ruby file to be used by Metasploit is extremely easy. Now, we're not going to do anything more than this. We can see an example here. It's actually run the exploit. We just did that ourselves. This is it for our tutorial. 
If you're interested in more information, or if you're interested in more information on exploits and exploit development, take a look at the Security 709 class by Stephen Sims. It is absolutely the best class I have ever seen when it comes to exploit development. He covers every modern technique in use for defeating all of the modern techniques for protecting our code. If you're on the development side or more on the security side and how to protect things, you might be interested in our secure coding class in C and C++. This is just an example of the kinds of vulnerabilities that are possible. In the class, we discuss all of the information you need on how to protect yourself from the common coding errors that occur in our organization's code. While C and C++ have been around for a long time, they still do make up a significant amount of code within our enterprise, particularly for back-end systems, also for embedded systems. So if we're putting out code, it's very important that we make sure that our programmers are doing it in a secure way. That's it for our demonstration here. We hope you enjoyed it. Please look for us at uh, the SANS Institute and feel free to send us email if you have any questions or comments.